Also, uh, thank you everyone for joining us for this uh, open box science and star protocols neuroscience protocol seminar. So my name is Ming Yu Sang. I'm a, a scientific editor at Star Protocols, uh, which is, is an open access peer reviewed cell press journal focusing on publishing robust working protocols. So today we are delighted to have two Star Protocols authors presenting their newly published protocols. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Run Rasmussen, who is a postdoc uh, researcher in Dr. Michael Nedegar's lab at the Center for Translational Neuromedicine at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. His training as a neuroscientist include in vivo physiology techniques such as intra and extracellular electrophysiology, extracellular ion measurements, and two photon calcium imaging. Today, he will present his protocol entitled Versatile Treadmill System for Measuring Locomotion and Neural Activity in Head Fixed Mice. So let's kick it off and welcome uh, Dr. Room. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for that introduction, Minyu. Um, and thank you for giving me the presentation, uh, <clears throat> the opportunity today to present our protocol. I'm really happy for that. Um, as already said, yeah, my name is Rune. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in uh, Professor Mike Niedergaard's lab. Um, my my um, main research focus right now is sort of centered around state-dependent neural activity, specifically in the visual system of mice. And with, um, <clears throat> with that topic, I try to sort of focus specifically on the interactions between uh, neurons, as well as a type of glial cell known as astrocytes. And I also am very interested in studying the contribution of local as well as global potassium ion changes in the brain uh, on neural processing. However, as already said, my, my talk today will be rather technical than biological, and uh, I'm very happy to get the possibility to present our recent STAR protocol that we titled Versatile Treadmill System for Measuring Locomotion and Neural Activity in Head-Fixed Mice. And so I, um, I have separated my talk today into essentially three main parts. First, I'll provide some biological context for why we uh, decided to develop and build this treadmill system in the first place. Um, and next, I'll give an overview and introduction to the technical components, as well as the sort of start to end experimental and engineering pipeline that you need to go through in order to use it. And finally, I'll end the talk by giving you two specific examples of how we have used this treadmill system in the lab where we have studied the cortical ion changes, as well as uh, arousal and pupil dynamic changes uh, in spontaneous locomotion in, in mice. But let me begin with providing some context. So <clears throat> we, we typically consider the neuronal responses to a given sensory input to be almost exclusively determined by the features of that particular sensory input. However, we are now beginning to, to learn and realize that also there is a notable modulation of these sensory responses within the brain that happens as a function of the ongoing internal state, as well as the behavioral state of the animal when that sensory input is provided. And, and one example of this in mice is when, when mice, they are locomoting and you provide a specific type of visual stimuli these responses to that input tends to be amplified, such as you can see here on this, uh, on this tuning curve for a visual cortical neuron um, from, a, from a very prominent paper by Pollock and Golshani. And so from this, a very natural next question is, what is the underlying mechanism and what is governing this state-dependent neuronal activity in the brain? And so previous work, they have mainly focused on rather local synaptic transmission mechanisms, such as, for example, disinhibition or enhanced excitatory drive uh, coming from the thalamic inputs. However, given that this um, behavioral state-dependent neural activity appears to be a rather cortex-wide and, and almost global phenomenon in the brain, we speculated whether there could be some alternative rather non-synaptic mechanisms also involved in, in, in governing this phenomenon. 
And a potential <clears throat> candidate for such is the is the um, is the ionic environment that surrounds all neurons and glial cells in the brain. And one particular extracellular ion species, which is very important for regulating neuronal activity, the resting membrane potential, excitability, and so on and so forth, is the extracellular concentration of potassium ions. And even rather subtle changes in the extracellular concentration of potassium ions is actually uh, potent enough to to cause a notable depolarization as well as increase in firing rate as, uh, as we previously showed with theoretical modeling. However, our knowledge about the dynamics of the extracellular potassium concentrations within the cortex of awake behaving animals was very limited at this time. And therefore in this project, we essentially asked, does the extracellular potassium concentration exhibit any systematic changes during this specific transition where animals goes from being in a quiet resting stationary state to an active locomoting state and if it does so could it potentially be involved in state dependent sensory processing so that was our overall goal at this time um, biologically and so in order to, to explore this we needed a treadmill system for head fixed mice since our Recording modality that allows us to track the extracellular ion concentrations can currently only be done in animals that are hex fixed. And so the, 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 the system that we needed to develop needed to fulfill a, a range of different requirements. Most importantly, it should allow mice to spontaneously transition between these states of being stationary and locomoting in order for us to assess the state dependent effects on ion dynamics. It also needed to be uh, rather easy to head fix the animals since we are working with awake animals. It's, it's a big um, benefit if it's easy to get the mouse in and out. And in addition to that, it also needed to provide a very high level of stability of the head in order for us to get uh, good high quality recordings during the experiments. Further, because we were looking at potentially rather fast occurring dynamic changes in the brain, it also needed to provide a high temporal uh, behavioral state resolution, uh, essentially. And it also needed to be as simple as possible for us to synchronize our recordings with standard electrophysiology uh, systems. And finally, <clears throat> in addition to these requirements, we, we, we figured that it would probably also be a strength if the system could sort of accommodate mice of, uh, of different sizes and sort of with different um, needs in terms of where they are most comfortable on this treadmill. And also because we are in the lab using for other experiments, not only uh, ion recording techniques, we're also using microscopy techniques on different recording modalities. We also want it to be easy to move the treadmill between recording rigs. And so next I will uh, introduce you uh, to the system and sort of how we went about building this. And so this is a, <clears throat> this is a scheme of, of what we essentially came up with. And so just to give you an idea about the dimensions of the system uh, is that it's roughly 25 centimeters deep and 30 uh, centimeters wide, as well as 20 centimeters high. And, and at least in, in our recording rigs, that makes it possible to fit into most in vivo electrophysiology as well as microscopy recording settings. So it makes it rather versatile um, experimentally to use. And so this is how the system actually looks in real life. Um, and so <clears throat> I will now try and take you through sort of the individual components and parts which again sort of uh, links back to the requirements that I, that I told you about uh, in the previous slide. So the entire system is built on a standard optical breadboard, and this essentially makes it easy for us to move it around between recording systems, and it's easy for us to, to fixate it on a standard um, air table, which we use um, in, the, in the lab. Then to allow uh, these easy geometry adjustments that I told you about to move essentially the mouse around on the treadmill relative to the head fixation point, like for example, further backwards or forwards on the wheel, we included a XY translational state 
uh, as the base for the treadmill itself. That's that's numbered here with uh, with the number two. And then the treadmill itself, uh, upon which the animal uh, moves and sits, is made uh, from a standard EVA foam roller, which you may be familiar with from your local gym or yoga studio. And the motivation for using this material was actually just one that it is, it's very lightweight. It's, it's rather cheap, it's easy to get. Um, also a big benefit is that the surface is, is quite soft and has some flexibility to it, which makes it better for stable recordings because the animal can sort of uh, assert a little bit of force into the treadmill rather than into the, into the head plate. Also, a big benefit is that it's super easy to clean this material in between animals, so you can get rid of any odor-related potential confounds in your experiments, and this material doesn't deteriorate by, for example, repeated use of ethanol cleaning. And so, to detect the rotation of this treadmill in order for us to actually assess the ongoing behavioral state and locomotion, we went for a magnetic optical rotary encoder. And this is uh, equipped then with a BNC ending of the cable. And this essentially makes it super easy just to plug the BNC into your normal standard uh, data acquisition device, like a, um, a digitizer. And what you essentially get out then is a voltage signal, which is proportional to the, to the rotational position of the treadmill. And these uh, magnetic rotary encoders, they can provide a very high resolution, which is uh, just plenty or even way more than you actually need to record uh, the spontaneous locomotion of mice. Then for the actual head fixation of the animal <clears throat> in this most recent iteration of the system, which you can see here by, by the number four and five, which you chose to use some um, rather sturdy head plate fixation arms. So these are the two arms that comes in from the two sides. Um, and we, we chose this, um, we chose this uh, geometry because it was again, super important for us that we could have very, very stable head fixation. And that's also why we chose to produce these in stainless steel. If, if you're doing experiments which are not so stability sensitive, um, you can definitely get away with making these shorter and smaller. So they don't have to be as, as long as ours. But if you're really going for high stability, like for in vivo whole cell patch clamp recordings or uh, synaptic spine imaging or something like that, we would definitely uh, advise you to go with a very sturdy solution like we did here. And then finally, for fixating the head of the mouse to the system, we fabricated a, a very simple, uh, pretty standard head plate made out of titanium, which makes it super strong, but still very lightweight since the mouse is, is, is walking around also in its home cage with this head plate implanted. And the titanium should, in theory, make it more biological compat uh, compatible as well. And to fix the head plate onto these two fixation arms, we either use uh, small bolts for our experiments because they have a, uh, a lower profile, but you can also use uh, simple thumb nuts, which are shown here on the image, which are much easier to, to, to fix on the small screws. Uh, and we use those typically for the behavioral habituation on the treadmill when we're not doing any, any recordings. And so <clears throat> this is uh, what the entire start to end timeline and pipeline uh, looks like. And so the first step includes the manufacturing of the custom parts that you need in order to build the system. And we, we, we strive to, to use uh, many off the shelf components uh, whenever it was possible to do so, but there are some components that need to be custom made. And we provide all the blueprints for that. So it should be fairly straightforward to either go to your local workshop at the university, if you have such a facility, or alternatively, there are, I'm sure, companies uh, that you can send these blueprints to, instruct them on what kind of material you would like uh, it to be produced in, and then they can do it for you. Um, so both, both possibilities should be pretty straightforward. Also, depending on if you have a workshop at your facility or don't, of course, then the time this step will take will be, will be variable. The next step is then essentially to assemble the system 
which which I would say should not take more than two to three days top if you have all the components uh, ready and available to you. The third step of the protocol then constitutes the surgical procedure in order to implant the head plate on the on the skull of the mouse. And again, this usually uh, is pretty fast and doesn't take much more than 30 to 60 minutes per mouse, depending on the uh, experience level of the surgeon. Um, the fourth step that you need to do is then uh, in order to get good um, reproducible data out of your pipeline, we highly advise that you do gradual habituation of the mouse uh, to this treadmill system. And what we do in our lab is that we usually do uh, three to six days of habituation, where on the first day, the mouse is head fixed on the system for maybe 10 to 15 minutes top. And then we gradually increase the duration that the mouse is head fixed on the system to, to make it more and more comfortable by being head fixed, as well as it also kind of <clears throat> needs to, to undergo a little bit of motor learning to actually locomote uh, smoothly on this treadmill system, since it is a bit unnatural to what it does in its home cage, for example. Um, the final step then constitutes the actual experiment that you want to do. And of course, depending on the nature of that, this can either be a acute one day experiment, or it can also be a more chronic experiment where, for example, you are repeatedly imaging the mouse over the course of days or weeks or even months. Um, and so that, that will dictate how long this step takes. Then also after that, that of course, um, is, is coming together with the analysis and depending again on your experimental setup, this can take uh, a long time or it can be shorter. Uh, in the protocol, we also provide uh, MATLAB code if you want just to analyze the basic uh, lo locomotor activity that, that you can extract with our treadmill system. And so <clears throat> to provide you a little bit more intuition about how does the system actually work and how does it look, um, I've included this, this small video. And so here the mouse you can see is, is head fixed and is sitting on top of the treadmill. And in this video, it's, uh, it's locomoting. So it's, it's, it's pursuing this uh, spontaneous bout of locomotion. Um, and these are the two sort of major signals that we get out of, of our protocol. The top one will show you the uh, raw signal coming out of the magnetic rotary encoder. So that essentially gives you the rotational position. And the lower trace that you will see is where we have derived then the momentary speed of the, of the treadmill during that same period. And so you can see here first, the animal is just resting, not doing anything. Then it's, 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 it's running a little bit, then it sits still, it's running again. <clears throat> and then it decides to, to be quiet again, be stationary, and then it transitions into another spontaneous look about, about here at the end. So this is essentially the main type of data that you will get out of this treadmill system, uh, speed as a function of time. And so uh, finally, for the, for the remaining part of my presentation, I will show you two examples of how we have used the treadmill system to probe some biological questions. And so most notable, as I also alluded to in the introduction, we, we, we decided to build this system because we wanted to study the behavioral state dependent dynamics in extracellular potassium concentrations. And for this, we recorded the extracellular potassium concentration in the cortex of the awake behaving mice using fine small glass microelectrodes. And we could then measure the dynamics of potassium as a function of the ongoing uh, locomotor activity of the mice. And this is a video of an example of how that looks. So you can see first the animal is resting, it's stationary, and the potassium is, is oscillating a little bit around a baseline level of around 3.5 millimolar. And then during a a bout of locomotion, you can see that the potassium increases quite notable, and then it stays up for the duration of that uh, activity bout. And then <clears throat> when the activity bout has, 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 uh, has stopped, the potassium sort of recovers towards baseline. 
and we could we could quantify this across animals and across such uh, behavioral state changes and we found a very robust uh, correlation in that every time a mouse is is uh, is running or walking on the treadmill the extracellular potassium concentration increases and on average it increases around 0.6 millimolar in this particular uh, layer and and cortical region that I'm showing here. Another thing that we could that we could see using our system, because again we have a very high temporal resolution of the locomotor signal, that allowed us to actually also look at at the temporal relationship between the potassium signal and the movement speed signal. And what we found was that the potassium in the brain tends to increase prior to when you have the actual locomotor activity onset, and it does so by around one to two seconds. So that was that was one application, and, and we use this uh, in many other um, specific sub-experiments, which are included in this uh, cell reports paper that we published in 2019. Then another application of the system, which we are currently developing and using in, in the lab right now for another line of research is to track the behavioral state uh, of the animal. And we do that by using the pupil uh, diameter as sort of a, a easy to measure proxy for the internal arousal level of the animal, similar to what other people have, have done before. And so, this is just a video showing you how that, that how that can look. So <clears throat> you can see on top you have the video with the uh, pupil being marked by an orange uh, ellipse, and then you have the pupil size, and then you have the movement speed uh, at the bottom of this video. And you can see when the animal transitions from being stationary and in the quiet wakeful next state, um, it, there is a, a very notable pupil dilation that comes before the actual movement onset, and that uh, heightened arousal level is maintained throughout the locomotor activity bout. And then once the activity on the treadmill has stopped, you can see that the pupil diameter sort of recovers and goes back to, to the baseline uh, in a uh, lower arousal state. Um, yeah, so, so we're using this. Uh, in our current experiments where we are doing both two photon imaging as well as uh, in vivo patch clamp recordings uh, from mice specifically within the visual cortex. And, and this allows us a very neat, easy to measure uh, proxy for the arousal level. I should say that the components and parts for the pupil tracking is not in the STAR protocol uh, article, but if anyone are interested in, in hearing about how we are doing that or want specific parts or components to set it up in their lab, uh, I'm happy to, to, to share that with you. Just, just let me know and send me an email. And so finally, I would just like to end my talk by acknowledging the people that were involved in this work. Uh, Eva Carlson and Mike Niedergaard for being co-authors on the article. Also a big thanks to Eric Nicholas who was a, a previous lab member of the Niedergar lab in, in, in the US, and he helped build a previous version of the system. Also a big thanks to Dennis Nestfogel and Alex Kwan for providing inputs and ideas for the uh, head fixation arms and the uh, production of the head plate. And then finally, Suna Peterson and Pally Koch for the technical help uh, from our local workshop here at the Panum Institute in Copenhagen helping us to produce some of the uh, custom made parts. And of course, also a big thanks to our funding agencies that support our research. And finally, but not least, thanks to uh, Open Box Science and Star Protocols for hosting this uh, webinar and for inviting me to present our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ru. That was very interesting. Uh, so I'm sure um, we will have some questions for you. So uh, just for our uh, audience, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions or submit it to our chat. Uh, so is there anyone have any question? Uh, actually, I have some questions for yeah. Dr. Room. So you met, you uh, mentioned that you try to apply this uh, to do some imaging work and the uh, patch clamp 
recording and you mm -hmm. say you focus on like visual cortex so yeah. i just wonder if we want to uh, look at other brain areas like probably hippocampus or even mm -hmm. other deeper region do you think that's mm -hmm. doable yeah that's definitely that's that's highly doable um basically the only thing the major thing that dictates which brain regions you can record from is essentially the um the head plate right so it depends on where you position it on the skull which which brain regions are accessible uh in the opening of the head plate and also the specific design of the head plate might need to be modified a bit if for example you want to target very lateral areas like the auditory cortex uh ours was sort of more optimized for visual cortex which is it sits uh, quite quite uh, easy to access in the mouse but yeah you can also uh, target deeper areas um, you could easily do that it's just through the opening um, I, yeah there's no problem in that and people are doing that both with imaging as well as electrophysiology etc so it should be very versatile it's essentially just a matter of uh, designing your head plate to fit the need I would say yeah yeah yeah, sounds really versatile. Yeah. And also, I noticed that you currently use the mouse age uh, from like seven to 14 days in your, in your protocols. So I just wonder if um, like other age uh, range can be used, yeah. Uh, yeah. like older ones. <clears throat> yeah. So we have only, I would say we have only tried really animals up to around maybe 14 weeks. Um, so, so typically we use eight to 14 weeks um also for other experimental reasons because they're easier to work with for for the patching etc but there i mean there is no reason why it shouldn't work um definitely over the course when you for example compare a mouse which is eight weeks compared to one which is let's say 20 weeks it does grow in size so it will be bigger meaning that it will sort of you know take up more space uh on the treadmill which could make the animal a little bit less comfortable because it now um, is, is, is essentially uh, larger on the treadmill. So that is one thing to consider also because older animals tend to be a bit uh, heavier. That could also maybe make the locomotion that you will see on the treadmill kind of less smooth in a way. Um, but but there is no reason why why it shouldn't be able to do it. And I think one one uh, nice part about our, our setup is then if you have older animals or younger animals that you're using frequently in between, it's quite easy to adjust the position of the treadmill to sort of as good as you can fit the size of the animal because you can also, and I didn't show you, so the XY stage allows you to move it forward or backwards for sort of more faster, quicker adjustments, but you can also make more or less space between the treadmill itself and the head plate such for example if you have a if you have a larger mouse you need to you need to increase that distance because otherwise the mouse will be a little bit squeezed uh below um, the head plate so and that's also quite easy to do is just four screws and then you can move it up or down um so yeah you could do that um so it sounds like the weight will be something we need to consider to modify the treadmill for the mice yeah exactly i would say if you if you use animals that are older than this range that we have tried probably probably a, and a benefit would be to use a slightly bigger treadmill essentially with a bigger diameter um and if anyone knows of a foam roller that you can get somewhere with a bigger diameter than what we have used which i on the top of my head thing is 15 centimeters in diameter if anyone knows where you can get a bigger standard foam roller please send me an email i haven't been able to find one and um, so if you use older animals i think the size of the, the foam roller becomes more important because you otherwise the animal will sort of be on the more curved part of that treadmill compared to a young small mouse yeah okay that's good to know yeah um so anyone from our audience have questions um so if not, I guess due to uh, time limits, we will uh, move on to our next speaker. Uh, so 